Now that we know what externalities are and why they are a problem, we need to ask the question of, can the government fix the problem? Keep in mind where we're going. The first part of the unit, we talk about how the market is going to fix everything, and if the government gets involved, the government's going to screw things up. Well, now we've said the market actually isn't always going to get everything right. In fact, it's often going to fail. So that makes the question necessary, can the government then fix it? And we'll see how the government can do. When we look at the problem of externalities, the problem is always down here on the Q-axis, that the private market in blue is producing more than what the larger society finds optimal. This would be our point, Q-social, would be our point of optimal allocation or allocative efficiency, which is really our goal in microeconomics. So the problem is often on the Q-axis. Typically, we can find the solution here on the Y-axis. If we look at what's going on on the diagram here, where we have a negative externality of production, well, what we can see is that basically the costs, the private costs are intersecting the marginal private benefit curve. Remember, this is also equal to marginal social benefit. They're intersecting this curve too low. Does, do the private parties, are they willing to buy only Q social? They are, but for them to only buy Q social, for them to buy less, the price has to be higher. So that's what I mean in saying that the solution is often on the p-axis. We just need to find a way to make these private costs higher so that they intersect the private benefit, the marginal private benefit curve, at a higher point. This is just based on our law of demand. Remember we're saying that the marginal private benefit curve is very much like the demand curve. So it's going to operate under the same principles. So if we can raise price, we're going to get this quantity, this quantity demanded, Q private, we're going to get it closer to quantity social. Based on what we looked at uh, last, the last part of the unit, uh, government intervention, we said, well, the government can use taxes and subsidies to move the, the MPC curve up or down, up with the tax and down with the subsidy. They can do that, and by doing so, we're going to bring those two quantities closer together. So this is going to be how we can use an indirect tax to correct a negative externality of production. Let's set up the story here. This is going to be on cigarettes, and we're going to say our marginal private costs, they're going to include all the costs that the consumers and producers of cigarettes face. So the cost, the actual what, what the consumer pays for cigarettes, the cost of the tobacco, the cost of forming them into cigarettes, the cost of advertising and marketing, the cost of packaging, transportation, all of those. The only difference between MPC and MSC, MSC includes all of those costs because it's important we remember something. Cigarette smokers are part of society. They're not separate from society, although some laws in California, where I'm from, make it seem like they are. Cigarette smokers are part of society, so society is still facing all of these costs that the producers and consumers of cigarettes are facing. However, additionally, they're facing other costs. Like, for example, uh, an innocuous one could be, whenever I go to a place where they're smoking, my, my clothes smell like smoke and I feel like I have to go get them dry cleaned. So that's an additional uh, cost of the existence of cigarettes. A more important cost are the health costs that cigarettes might cause. So people getting sick and you know going to um, having to go to the hospital, secondhand smokers especially, because remember the cost to the cigarette smokers themselves are likely to be on the NPC curve already. So what we're going to show is how we can use an indirect tax to reduce the size of this deadweight loss to society. This is really where we see our problem, the green shaded triangle. We can see that when the government adds a specific indirect tax to the purchase of cigarettes, it's going to be seen as a cost that moves the MTC curve up. What that means is that the quantity demanded and supplied in the market is going to move here to Q3. So it's going to be getting closer to the socially optimal quantity. 
We can show this on the diagram by pointing out that if we go up from this to the margin, marginal social cost curve, that the new size of our deadweight loss to society, the blue triangle, is significantly smaller than the original triangle. The specific tax has reduced the amount of deadweight loss to society. So we can say that this tax has been effective in correcting the externality. Okay, we're gonna look at th the three other examples of externalities and see how government policies can affect them as well. With a positive externality of production, well, now we're saying that the socially optimal quantity is greater than the quantity the private market is producing, so we want to move this to the right. Well, again, we can easily see that if we subsidize the production of this good, whatever it is, we usually use training for this or education. If I'm a business and I'm thinking, well, man, I'd like to send my workers off to get some better training so that they are better workers and can do more for me, there will be spillover benefits, though, to other companies. Say one of the employees that I hire or uh, that I send off to training, say they decide after a while, maybe two or three years down the line, to go into business for themselves. Well, they can take that knowledge and then spread it out to other people, or maybe they get hired on at, at another company. And again, they can look at that and say, well, the one company saved money, the second company saved money because this person was already trained by the first company. So the cost to the individual business is spilling over and is reducing costs to another business. So that's our spillover benefit. Again, here we can see, okay, well, here's the new level of consumption right here. We'll call that Q3. And what that means is the amount of our positive externality has been reduced. I'll have to say this at least a few more times, but you have to remember that reducing this, even though this is the whole area represents a spillover benefit, we want to reduce it because it's better if everyone gets that training. If this spillover benefit is me getting training and then passing it along to somebody else, it would be better if that second person also received directly the training. They would understand it better, they would have a firmer understanding than just going through me. Think about the telephone game that maybe you play as a kid. So yes, we want to reduce the size of this positive externality because we want to get this, this quantity closer to what society wants. We've seen how subsidies and taxes can work to move the MPC curve up and down and get our uh, private quantity closer to our social quantity. Let's think about some other ways that we can do this, though, that don't involve a tax or a subsidy. If we look at a positive externality of consumption, um, what we can see again is that the private party is consuming something that is having spillover benefits to a third party. Typically here we talk about a flu vaccine or any kind of vaccine, medicine, something like that. I take the medicine, it's a benefit to me, but it's also a benefit to you because you don't get sick from me. We could try to use a um, subsidy, just like we used over here, to push this curve down. And by pushing the MSC curve down, this would be the, the MPC curve that we would be pushing down at that point. We can do that, however, there's a big negative effect, and that is subsidies are expensive. It would take a lot of money to do that. It'll also take a lot of money to do what we're gonna talk about advertising, but maybe it's more effective, or maybe it's less expensive, or maybe you're gonna do a little bit of both, a little bit of a subsidy and a little bit of advertising. Imagine if this is for flu shots and the government is saying, well, people just aren't recognizing the benefit. They don't really demand the flu shot because they don't think the benefit to themselves is all that great. What we're gonna do then is we're gonna run a bunch of advertising, we're gonna put a bunch of literature out, we're really gonna get the word out that the flu shot is a good thing and it can really help you. And maybe we're gonna point out how, you know, if we get a lot of people taking the flu shot, the chances of other people getting the flu is also reduced. So in doing this, this would be, we would see this as a shift of demand, it's increasing taste for the flu shot, and an increase of demand is going to move the MPB curve over to the right. Let's see what that will look like. So after the advertising, we've seen that marginal private benefit has moved to the right. Each person sees a greater benefit for the product. The quantity is going to move to the right. 
That is, it's going to move closer to Q social. The amount of the potential welfare gain will be uh, reduced. I've seen a lot of, maybe not advertising from the government, but a lot of YouTube videos and things lately about how, you know, how we're, we're always online and we're always paying attention to our phones and we're not paying attention to things around us. Now there's obvious negatives like people, um, I believe for teenagers, the number one cause of vehicular death now is no longer drunk driving, but is actually death um, because of texting while driving. Well, that's a very obvious thing, but then there's other things like well, we just don't have deep relationships anymore because all we do is talk to people on Facebook. So there's been a lot of things that are suggesting that people should be less connected to the internet and more connected to individuals, to other people around them. Anyhow, that advertising is telling you not to do something, so it's negative advertising. And as it shifts to the left, we're going to get a new quantity here. So we see quantity private moving closer to quantity social, and the amount of the welfare loss is again reduced. We're gonna go back to looking at, uh, this is gonna be cigarettes again, so a negative externality of production. And let's look at our two price controls and see what might happen. If our market price is gonna be here, let's look first at, okay, well, what if we raised the price and therefore we moved up the marginal private benefit curve, thereby reducing the amount of, um, of cigarettes consumed. Well, remember, when we set a price floor, it's not only gonna affect, um, it's not only gonna affect consumers, it's also going to affect suppliers. So we would raise the price of cigarettes, and yes, less people would smoke, but at the same time, there would be this surplus because at a higher price, suppliers are more willing and able to produce cigarettes. So then there's this question of, well, what are they going to do with all these excess cigarettes? It was one thing when that excess was corn or something like that, but it doesn't seem like when you look at our, our overall picture of we're not using our resources efficiently, it doesn't seem like using more resources to produce more cigarettes is really a very good outcome even though there will be less cigarettes bought and sold. Well, so that's not going to work. Uh, what about a price ceiling? Well, again, this seems a little bit awkward. Now we're saying, well, here's the price ceiling and price can't go above it. Remember, for it to be effective, it has to be lower than the market price. Well, doesn't that send the wrong signal to say, here's a product we don't want you to use, so we're going to make it cheaper? That's kind of, a, that's kind of an odd thing to say. And yeah, we could point to it would work. We would say, well, you know, at a lower price, suppliers are less willing to supply, so only Q Social will be supplied, and there'll be this massive uh, shortage, and there'll be much greater demand at this price. Well, maybe we're getting the effect we want, but that is a really weird signal to send. Also here, you can see very easily, if there's a massive, um, shortage, there's all these people who want to buy cigarettes at this price or at a slightly higher price, it really creates a way, um, it really creates an opportunity for somebody to start doing this illegally. So this is going to create a very big opportunity for a black market for cigarettes, what we call a parallel market. It's outside of the normal market, but it's still there. This is going to create a lot of opportunity for that to occur. Um, you do see in places where cigarette prices are quite high, it's very common that they will cross a border and bring cigarettes in. Um, that actually happens quite a lot. The same thing can be true here for a price floor. If we set prices artificially high, somebody's going to find a way to go get cigarettes cheaper some other place and sell them illegally below the cost of, uh, below the price of that price floor. So there's lots of reasons that price controls aren't a very good way to fix externalities, um, and those are some of them. I make the analogy of this. When we talk about market failure, we're saying the car isn't running right, the car's not driving right, maybe the brakes um, aren't working the way they're supposed to be working. Well, when we talked about government intervention, we said especially for price controls, the government doesn't really know what it's doing. So now we're taking a bad car and putting a bad driver into it. That seems to be a pretty bad idea.